Topic for today, managing devices and data out of the office. And uh, my name is Joe O'Donnell. I'm a the senior technical engineer and instructor at Terrapin Technology. And accompany me is the wonderful Betty Nelson. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Happy to be with you for another webinar Wednesday. Not sure how we already got to May of 2021. But here but it we is. we did. Yeah, right. Yeah. We survived. It's a good thing. Here it is. So without further ado, as our normal operating uh, procedure, we're going to turn off our beautiful mugs here. That way we don't distract you with our good looks and we can just charm you with our discussion that we're going to have today. Lots to talk about. So we're going to we're going to jump right in it. This is something that Betty, you and I have talked about quite a bit. And uh, quite honest, I think we had probably the most discussions about this. We have, and you know, we are a couple of geeks. I think we could go on for hours on this topic. And I'm a little concerned that after the presentation, uh, this topic might be keeping our clients up at night because it's definitely something we should be concerned about. Absolutely. You know, we're going to address that. We're going to talk about some best practices and keeping your information safe. And we can't talk about best practices without talking about consequences uh, if that data gets in the wrong hands. So yes. that We're... really kind of takes us to the beginning. Yep. First and foremost, the number one thing <clears throat> to start with is passwords. And we're in a day and age where we, you know, we used to keep passwords on a sheet of paper or a post-it. I've seen post-its on the monitor. That's so convenient for whoever's going to hack in. Um, a text file on your computer. We used to do that. Most people did, and you can't do that any longer. And also, reusing passwords is another real issue. It's the most common way attackers gain access to your personal information. So, Joe, what's the solution? Well, it's not having your secretary keep all your passwords for you, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot to this. And I think the, the biggest thing that I'll just have to admit for myself, I just had to swallow my pride and go, and this is something I had to invest in was a password management tool. And that's going to allow you to use complex passwords that uh, you know you can keep securely and you know that they meet the policies and recommendations that are uh, industry standard and a password management app boy it's i have to say it's the first step in really preventing that unwanted access to your data and helping you keep track of it one password is one that uh, i have myself have used personally uh, i've used a number of them over the years uh, this is not a plug for 1Password. It's just happened that we use this one and we found it really easy to use. Uh, we implemented it for our team and it just provides a place for users uh, you know, on our team and individually to share passwords as well as keep private passwords. Software licenses, it has a place to keep that information and other uh, sensitive information in what uh, I guess you would call a virtual vault. Uh, that's a blocked, or I should say locked and blocked with a PBKDF2 guarded master password. Right, Betty? <laughs> so easy for you to say, Joe. Um, it rolls off the tongue. You know, it's we're talking about encryption here. Nobody else will know your master password. So the, key, the idea <clears throat> behind this is have a master password that gets you into one password and then have very complex and alphanumeric passwords for your various websites. You don't have to memorize them because 1Password does that for you. Um, right. and, and Terrapin did a lot of work vetting password management tools when we chose 1Password. And I was, you know, I'm old school. I was reluctant to use it thinking, oh, my way's, you know, it's my way or the highway, my way's better. But I've succumbed to the pressure and now I really feel much safer. Um, another cool thing that 1Password offers is, I think we both did something at the same time. There, there. it is. Uh, yeah, another cool thing that 1Password offers is their watch tower notifications. Yeah. What that allows you is to receive timely notifications about websites you frequently use. 
Watchtower alerts you to security problems with the websites you visit. That will help you keep all your accounts safe. It's built right into 1Password. You can configure the notifications to let you know immediately or, you know, a different schedule. It yep. will also let you know if the password you are using is one is on one of the lists floating in the black ether, the dark web. That's right. Yeah. That's one of my favorite little little uh, value added features that uh, they've added into this particular program. I think there might be others that do the same thing is letting you know, hey, the password you're about to you entered in or that you entered in, uh, it's on lists that you, so you right. probably shouldn't use that. Right. So then you can change your password. And the other thing it alerts you to is whether the website you're logging into offers multi or two factor <clears throat> authentication. And if it does offer two factor authentication, you're going to hear later in this presentation that we strongly recommend that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so all those things, it'll it'll let you know all of that in the program. But it's very minimal, keeping the passwords secured, keeping them complex, but not necessarily having to memorize what all these are or uh, using those post-it notes as we were probably doing. Now, we're not going to dive into all the ins and outs of, of passwords. We've talked about this before. Uh, you do have to use industry standards when it comes to this. And there are recommendations for that. There's recommendations for how complex uh, they need to be, which is never a bad idea of making them to be complex. Uh, and complex can mean different things. I'll just say that we've talked about that before, and there are uh, different ways you can do that, as well as policies that you can implement if you have a server that you can implement uh, across your user base, even if you're using something as simple as Microsoft 365. So key thing here to remember, please don't use dictionary words, your kid's names, your pet's name, uh, your ex's name uh, with, <laughs> you know, expletives after it. Uh, it. Just adding a number on the end of something doesn't really work anymore. Uh, it's just not secure. And honestly, it's just ill-advised because if we know that's what people are using, you can be sure that people that have been hacking and been in the computer industry for a long time, they know how to get around those things as well. So key for myself was I just had to stop being lazy and put my pride aside <laughs> and uh, move up with the move up with the times to keep up with things. We appreciate that, Joe. Yeah, um, you're welcome. <laughs> the next thing that is critical is making sure you have antivirus and URL filtering. Now, most Terrapin clients opt for our advanced security bundle, which includes OpenDNS for URL and website filtering. We offer WebRoot for antivirus and Proofpoint for email and URL filtering within email. And URL just means a link to a place on the internet. Uh, that's where you run into a lot of trouble when those links are gonna take you to a bad website when they've been hijacked. So exactly. this is like so critical that we have this in place. It is. And you notice while we while we mention antivirus here in front of you, you notice that it's kind of a, a three, a multi-pronged approach where Yes, you do have an antivirus program, but there's more to just antivirus. There's the antivirus, there's the, the, the filtering that uh, Betty talked about. That, that multi-pronged approach is how you're going to help keep things uh, secure. But hey, I have a Mac, so I don't have to really uh, worry about those things, right? Well, uh, <laughs> I go to websites, it's not going to affect me, uh, those types of things. Aren't, aren't going to affect me, right? Well, Wrong. Well, <laughs> it used to, it yeah. used to be the case um, many years ago <clears throat> that most viruses were written for Windows computers, but that's not the case anymore. And, yeah, they come um, through the net now. They do. And so there are lots of antivirus options for Macs. Um, I read a great article on this topic, and I'm putting the link in the chat window uh, because somebody who's passionate about cybersecurity and is also passionate about using Macs went ahead and did this work for us, and he actually tested 
numerous uh, antivirus solutions because some work better with Macs than others. And he tested it with actual issues on a Mac computer with infections and then rated them. So anybody participating today that's interested in hearing about that, please copy that link and check out that article and make sure you're using something on your Mac. That was a really good find, by the way, that, uh, that Betty found. Uh, the, the two things that we come across uh, with our clients that have Macs, and we're finding this more and more, ransomware and what we refer to as remote code execution. And the ransomware, I think we've talked about that in the past, you know, they're going to get on your computer somehow, encrypt things and ask for, hey, you got to pay us or we're going to leave everything encrypted. The remote code execution uh, is usually done by you getting some type of pop-up on your screen and it's saying, oh, you need to update Adobe Flash or you need to uh, update this program or you need this you know, or that. There's some type of little threat uh, that goes on there to help you click on something. And then once you do, it loads it and then you've you know, added that uh, remote code execution or that malware onto your Mac to take advantage of it. So you know, when we talk about antivirus, and the reason we kind of singled up Macs and, and not just Windows and Macs is really any computer, any computer is susceptible to these types of threats nowadays. And it's not just one or the other. Uh, the bad guys don't care what you have. They're just going to try to take advantage of any situation. And if anybody feels secure and they start getting lax, that means there's an open door there and they're going to try to take advantage of that target, uh, regardless of the operating system. Uh, some of right. my, you know, I think we in the past, Betty, we've talked about how people felt safe with PDF files. Now, those can't contain viruses. I'll never have to worry about a threat from the PDF file. Oh, nay, nay. Uh, that's <laughs> it just doesn't happen anymore. So we we have to be careful. We, have we to do. Be careful. Um, one of the one of the ones that uh, Betty found, I just wanted to mention this real quick uh, for securing Max. And this is mentioned in the link that she had was Antigo. Uh, is really good. I use Avira on my computer, my Mac. Both work really, really well. So check that out. Check that out. And I was leaping ahead here um, to the next topic, which is managing updates for your computers and devices. So first of all, if you implement the three things we just mentioned, a password management to tool, having an antivirus solution, and using URL filtering, you will alleviate nine out of 10 attempts to hack your computer. You'll be covered for the majority of things if you have gone ahead and secured that type of protection for your computer. But there's more you can do. Joe, why don't we talk about this? Yeah, so that's we talked about this multi-pronged approach. So those are the givens. You've got those. Yes, I know I need to take care of those. So you get that taken care of. But most attacks that we find usually happen for vulnerabilities that there's already been a patch or some type of update that fixes it. So why is it a problem? Well, you guessed it. Yep. The patch or the update wasn't installed. Yep. So managing those patches, making sure the updates are installed, Macs, Windows, your mobile phone, so that those vulnerabilities are, are secured and they don't become a threat or a risk for you and your data is simply all that needs to be done. But the problem is most of us uh, usually fall into the category of I have Mac updates and my Windows updates are scheduled automatically. Aren't they automatically installing? Survey says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't be so sure. I also think the other problem is even if you have the auto updates configured, I've certainly been on a client's computer where I need to shut it down and it says install updates and shut down and they go, oh no, we don't, we don't have time for that. And I think how long have those updates been waiting? And they've been mm -hmm. saying, I don't have time for that. And, exactly. you know, the bottom line, what takes more time, having your computer hacked or installing the updates? And I think we all know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing I want to talk about in this area is remembering about laptops and notebook computers. You know, our desktop computers in an office are fixed 
piece of equipment that's not moving. So those are easily updated. They're there all night. They're plugged in at the office. They're on the firm's network, but laptops can come and go. And so I just wanted to mention that as a definite concern from my perspective. I know a lot of people are not paying close enough to attention, attention to whether their laptops are being updated or they forget to plug them in and have right. them on and have them uh, with, you know, internet, uh, ac access during the evening. So I wanted to bring that up. And as far as Terrapin's clients, the majority of you have your updates managed by Datto RMM. That's a process we use. And, and, you know, it's wonderful. Like yesterday, there was an Outlook issue that popped up for maybe one or two users at different firms where they couldn't see anything in an email, but the first line once we figured out what the fix was, we were able to push out that update right away to users without having to remote to their computer or anything. So it's a great yeah. service that we provide. But if you're not using Terrapin to manage that, we highly recommend that you do implement some type of a system to manage your updates. Right. Talk to your IT admin or your MSP that you're working with and, and see if there's something that you can implement or maybe they already have and you didn't know it so you can be informed about it because installing those updates that is part i would say a big part of that multi-pronged approach in protecting yourself and your data and Absolutely. of course that goes down to your mobile mobile devices as well i mean you talked about notebook computers but hey our android devices our iphones and such all of those have updates that get pushed out uh, when you know there's always the conundrum of do i install the update and it's going to break something right or do i not install the update and then what type of security risk am i going to take in my book yeah i i usually you know i don't want stuff to break but more problems can come if i have a security uh, incident on my phone or my computer that far outweigh the problems i might have that come from installing an update um, operational wise right so, and i i I, I agree with you. And I also think people don't understand how vulnerable their mobile devices are. So many people are receiving text messages now from, you know, people that they're not familiar with. Somebody saying, here, lose 40 pounds, click this link. Or <laughs> you, I get that one a lot. Or win this free iPad, click this link. Are you qualified for this? Those are all <laughs> slippery slopes. Do not click on those links that will for sure take you somewhere you don't want to go and put your mobile device at risk. Um, the recommendation Absolutely. yeah, is to delete them. Just delete them. Yeah, just delete it. Uh, you, you're, you're, you, there's an invalid charge on your credit card or yeah. your uh, car warranty is about to expire. I get those voicemails all the time. Yep. So what can you do? Well, this is this is one that's been around for a while. Uh, you know, even in the news recently, I noticed that uh, Google said that they're going to start enabling this for all Google accounts out of the box. It will no longer be an optional thing you turn on. They're going to make it uh, de facto standard as soon as you set up an account. You know, and it's so if the industry is starting to make that the default, for those of us that have been working with mobile devices and we work with online accounts, and let's be honest, whether it's an online account or a website or not, this type of uh, securing with two-factor authentication, despite the inconvenience, hands down, I got you, inconvenient, I don't like it. But again, what's the flip side? I don't wanna have to be calling my clients and saying, hey, we had a security incident and all of your passwords and data could have been compromised. Uh, I would rather go through uh, the moment of getting a text message or answering a little yes or no question on my phone for two-factor authentication than having to write that letter or make that phone call to my client. Right. And, and so, we're going we're gonna to talk about that later. It is actually not even something that you really have the option to ignore if you're practicing law. I mean, the State Bar and the American Bar Association both are mandating that if it's available, you should be using it. So it's, Absolutely. It's, it's literally like buckling your seatbelt. If you do it, you don't even think about it twice. So I really don't yeah. understand why anyone is dragging their feet on this. 
And there are other value, you know, I would say value added things that come along with doing that. Uh, you know, for example, we implement a lot of two-factor authentication using a product called Duo so that you can implement it with your server and your logins. Uh, you can implement it with your uh, email and lots of other things. But in addition to that, it'll give you little metrics such as, well, you know, if someone hasn't updated their phone to this level, uh, please report it or don't allow them to use it. Uh, you can have that type of tracking uh, on what they're, what device they're using and whether or not it's up to date or not. And uh, Dato, I mean, not Dato, but Duo will let you know that and provide, again, it's the extra layer of protection that'll help you manage the two-factor authentication. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft 365 has similar little products, not quite with all little bells and whistles like that. Again, the think the, the key is, just, let's just get it turned on and implemented yeah. and at the bare minimum so that you're protected. And then you can always think of ways to maybe uh, make it more efficient or polish it a little bit. That's right. So we just talked about two-factor authentication, and um, that's going to lead me into just talking about mobile device security in general. Uh, client data on your mobile devices is a big concern. If you don't think it is, talk to the State Bar of California if you're an attorney. You have a mandatory requirement to let all of your clients know if your mobile device, your laptop, any of those things have been lost, stolen, compromised. And so there's definitely some stuff you can be doing to make your device more safe. We recommend a minimum of a six digit passcode, alphanumeric if possible, to open your mobile device. Uh, make sure you have Find My iPhone or the Android equivalent activated and working. This allows you to wipe data from your phone if it has been lost or stolen. Yes, the device does have to be on and connected to the internet for this to work. So you can't rest on this completely. And professional mm -hmm. thieves will definitely be doing some things that Joe understands that I don't. So that they will, so you will not be able to wipe that data, but you definitely want the feature turned on. You wouldn't want to tell your uh, human resources director that, no, I didn't have Find My iPhone turned on, or no, I didn't think to have a complex passcode. That wouldn't go over very well. We also right. um, a, think that you should set up face recognition, touch ID, anything that's going to make the device work only for you and not others. And I, in fact, have face recognition turned on for my Terrapin Office 365. So I can't open my Outlook without face recognition or without entering my passcode a second time. Face recognition has been not so fun during COVID. I don't know why I've been lazy. I should try to do a face recognition with my mask on, uh, but I haven't. So uh, I'm using my complex passcode a lot more, uh, but that's something we really want to make sure you do. Absolutely. And again, it's 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 beyond the time where it's, it's now a necessity. It's not yeah. just an option or... Uh, a feature that people talk about, it really is a necessity. And again, it's one of those things where you don't really think about it until something happens. And then when you're answering the questions or your insurance carrier is asking you questions, you didn't have these things or weren't using them. And they're like, oh, well, you you know, you know, you were supposed to have that turned on. So now we can't help you. That's Oops, right. That's a big oops right there. That's a big one. You know, we, we did talk about uh, Duo, you know, and we're talking about securing mobile devices, we don't want to go too deep into this, but if you need to get more advanced security or layering in your mobile devices, uh, there are always things you can do uh, beyond that, uh, such as mobile device management, uh, or you'll hear the acronym MDM management uh, for that. Uh, this is a, it's a real, it's kind of a completely different topic, but if you have questions on it, feel free to reach out to us. It gets kind of deep into what you can do, what you can allow, creating sandboxed areas on mobile devices so that you can completely control and wipe that data. Um, it's encrypted on the phone and separate from anything else a user might put on their personal phone. Uh, so they're not uh, mixing together. Uh, and I know in the past we've used, used Microsoft 365 Intune to do this or 
a mobile iron, you may have heard of that before, are some ways that you can get more granular. Again, we're not going to get too deep into that, but just know that there are options if you need to go beyond what we've talked about so far, uh, where you can really, really secure things down uh, if necessary and depending on your industry. That's right. So let's talk about the next big topic, backups. Um it's a big that one. is that is the savior right there. I mean, you know, I don't know how much people are paying attention to the news this week, but they are talking about cybersecurity big time with the pipeline being hacked. And also there's a big argument right now because the White House just released a statement saying it's up to the private industry whether they pay rants of the ransom or not when their files have been compromised. And of course, the FBI has always said never pay ransom. What does that mean? We are relying on the backups of our data to get our operation back up and running. So right. most clients have backups of their servers. Some clients have backups of their computers. But the majority of Terrapin's clients back up their servers and then redirect their computers to save files to their My Documents, which is on their, usually, their H drive for home, H for home, that is on the server. It's easy to get to. It feels like it's on your computer, but it's on a server and it's getting backed up. So the problem is if you're saving anything to your desktop, a USB drive, even my documents on your C drive, for the majority of people, that data is not being backed up. And I mean in a, in a business setting. Unless you specifically have made arrangements to have your computer backed up. And, you know, most Terrapin clients have data appliances. That's what back up, backs up your servers. But now, because so many are, people are using... Microsoft 365, clients that have that have also purchased a different type of backup from Datto called SaaS backup. And that's Wait, backing you, up. You mean that's not automatically backed it's up by not. Microsoft or and Google? A, a lot of people don't understand that, say, if they have a Datto appliance and that's backing up their server and they have Office 365 for their email and they're not purchasing Datto SaaS protection, things in Outlook are not being backed up unless they've arranged to have something else like Barracuda archiving or Proofpoint archiving. Those are all available, but it's something we need to talk about because people assume it's being backed up and it's not. So data SaaS protection is wonderful. It works with the Google suite and also with Microsoft 365. So if your firm is small and you have no servers and you're using OneDrive and SharePoint, and Microsoft Office, and you have the SaaS protection, you're good to go. That's all being backed up. And it's really easy to use. So I had a, a client the other day accidentally import 12,000 contacts into their contacts. I won't even go into how that happened. But all I had to do because they had, <laughs> yeah, we won't go there. All I had to do because they had Datto SaaS protection is go to the day prior, restore that, and then it was up to her to say, okay, good, all my contacts I love are now in this new folder. She didn't even have to close out of Outlook. It just showed up, and then she was able to delete the contacts that she didn't want. So oh, that's great, that's great, yeah. but that's too expensive though. I don't wanna spend like 20 bucks per mailbox to do this every month, right? Exactly, it's worth any penny you're spending on this. And the other thing I wanna talk about is your yeah, mobile. Tell them how much it is, tell them how much it is, Betty. Well, it's not a lot, it is less than- It's like than, a couple dollars a month per month. Yeah, mailbox. it's less than $2 a month per user. So how do you Crazy. say no to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is your mobile devices. You know, I'm an iPhone user, so I'm not personally familiar with Androids, but I can have my, I have mine set to back up to iCloud every night. I plug my phone in every night. I know that everything's backed up. And if somebody stole my phone and I needed to get everything back, when I buy a new phone, I can download from that backup. So everyone should be paying very close attention to backups. And yeah, you, you just can't, I mean, we, this is another topic we could talk a long time about is just backing up data. 
And it, it has only become more important as we have been doing the working from home thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say this is kind of a good time to talk about the security from that that aspect is, gosh, I mean, you how, you know, how, what, how are you remoting in? Are you a remote desktop server? Go to my PC. What, what are some things that we should consider on that, Betty? Yeah, and most of our clients are doing those things. And most of our clients are using a remote desktop server, which is secure. And most of them are using it with Duo, making it even more secure. Go to my PC is another popular solution for clients that didn't want to invest in a terminal server. And go to my PC has two factor authentication. I think everybody should be using that. Absolutely. Um, but some of the things to consider are you know, does your firm allow you to save files on your local computer? Do you save files on your local computer if you're working from a home computer? Mm -hmm. Are those files being backed up? because they need to be, or right. you need to make sure that's not the only copy of the file that you've downloaded to your local computer. Um, who's using the computer at home? Are all the users engaging in safe practices? These are all things we need to think about. Absolutely. And, and one of the reasons you wanna think about that is, uh, you know, we just talked about backups, making sure the right things are backed up and you don't lose any work product, because in the end, we don't want you to be a, a victim of what uh, Betty already hinted at that's going on with the colonial pipeline on the Eastern US. But any of those things and talking about the cybersecurity and ransomware, which is really running rampant uh, with uh, on the national news and talking about how much money and time is uh, extorted out of companies because of ransomware. Right. Now, uh, you have a couple links regarding this, uh, right, Betty, from the uh, Department of Homeland Security? I do. Um, and there was a, recently a, a, a webinar they put on too, right? There was. And I'm going to add that link as well. And uh, the Department <clears throat> of Homeland Security has partnered with the United States Chamber of Commerce, and they're really making a big push to keep small businesses safe and to make sure you understand what you can be doing to help keep your businesses safe. The majority of attacks and money lost come through email, through phishing campaigns. So always remember that. But ransomware is still a concern, uh, getting those infections on your computers. So I'm going to add some links I know we're running a little over schedule, um, but these links are great. I highly recommend that you download the ransomware guide, that you watch the presentation that they have um, for you that was just released on May 5th. And uh, again, because we're running over, I don't want to go into it too much more than that. But whenever we give our security presentations um, to your firms. And remember, if you're interested in having a security presentation, just reach out to Joe or I, and we're happy to schedule that for you at no charge. But definitely check this stuff out. It's going to be really useful. That was a really, really good find. Now, uh, here's another one. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep this brief, because this was one that Betty and I talked about quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> is Wi-Fi and mm -hmm. you know it, something that happens quite frequently and we we kind of play the the part of innocence on a lot of this a lot of times because we're like oh you know I'll, I'm just going to remote it I'm not doing anything I'm, I'm remoting into my server which is secure and stuff but the problem is that public Wi-Fi spots even if they have a password could be monitored by someone on that particular Wi-Fi network that's looking for stuff, looking for vulnerabilities on the computers connected to it, or uh, even more popular, especially in large metropolitan areas, uh, very common in uh, businesses that offer nationwide Wi-Fi or airports and other locations like that, is putting up a Wi-Fi pineapple. You're like, no, Wi-Fi pineapple, what in the world is that? And we're, we're gonna look at that in a second, but I just have to say, I cannot let this presentation go by without saying, 
it is not safe to go to the Hilton or any other hotel and log on even with your room number and your last name. That is still not secure. And I know tons of attorneys do it. Same with working at the airport. Same with going to Starbucks. It's not safe unless you have other precautions in place. Um, Absolutely. Okay. And I, so, I bet you were like, you're like, what? Yeah. I know. It, it bothers really me because I know how many people do it. Joe highly recommends using a personal hotspot over any of these Wi-Fi's that are provided, you know, even when you're getting your nails done, whatever the case may be, yeah. you know, you really can't trust it. So use your iPhone or your Android phone as a personal hotspot. And now let's really frighten the heck out of you when we look at the next slide, because I know it did for me. <laughs> okay, here's your quiz. Yeah. Which one of these is the real, genuine Starbucks Wi-Fi hotspot? You go to Starbucks and all of these show up. And well, these I, didn't, are... I didn't get it right at all. And this, this is a screenshot, a real screenshot from somebody's, when they went to Starbucks and they went up, you know, on their computer to their cute little Wi-Fi rainbow, it looks like a rainbow, shaped like a cone, and you see all these different options to connect. All the ones that aren't the correct one are the bad guys trying to get you to connect to their Starbucks so they can't gain access to your data. Yep. That's the truth. So I first guessed the top one in all caps. Joe said <laughs> no. I guess the, I, I literally started going down the line. Then I guessed the second one. He also <laughs> said no. I guessed the third one. No. Me, me. The correct oh. one. Joe, tell us which one. And the winner is Google Starbucks all by itself. I never would have guessed that. What? In the I mean, world? that's scary. And they all have the padlock next to them, meaning they're secure, but they're yeah. not. <laughs> no, and these uh, rogue access points are very popular for ways for people to redirect your, your search engine. So when you go through their, their hotspot, You've connected, you think you're secure, you don't think about it anymore. You go to Google, you do a search, it's being redirected to a website for searches that they want to push to you. So you go in and you're like, oh, well, I'll go to my banking website. It's a secured website. Uh-huh, yeah, but they're gonna redirect you to one that looks like it is uh, Wells Fargo or Citibank or uh, Chase, looks just like it. Enter in your username, enter in your password, Oh, incorrect username, password. Oh, I'll just enter it again. Too late. Right. You've already they, supplied the information. Right. And what Joe, what Joe was trying to explain to me, which I was so not wanting to hear, is say you get on one of these, even if you get on the real Starbucks um, provided Wi-Fi, that anyone in the area, you know, yes, I'm going to go to office.com and log in, and maybe I have two-factor authentication set up for that. So what? You just entered your email address and your password. I mean, you're still kind of giving keys to the kingdom. And what if that's a password you use in lots of other ways? Now you're mm -hmm. in big trouble. So I know this is so disappointing to hear that, especially now with COVID and people are working from all over, but it simply isn't safe unless your firm has made other arrangements. And the other yeah. thing that's shocking is that, you know, a lot of companies will tell their employees you cannot use free wi-fi but verizon says that 85 percent of employees admit they still do yeah. so um the burdens on you to set something up to make sure things are secure um exactly use yeah. a use a vpn use your mobile hotspot uh so that you can eliminate, you can minimize the risk. That's what you want to do. Is you want to minimize the risk. Is what we're Correct. what we're trying to do. Let's talk about the ugly stuff, Joe. Yeah. So we're we're getting uglier as we kind of get into this, and that's <laughs> unfortunate. And thank you for hanging on to us for a little bit longer uh, yeah. for our presentation. This day. is our last slide. It won't go forever. It it won't be too long. Uh, basically, worst case scenario, let's say that your data has been compromised. Uh, you're 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 frightened out of your soul. Your laptop's been stolen. Your cell phone was uh, lost. You know, it took a hike or you dropped it on a hike. Who knows? Uh, you left your tablet at Starbucks or uh, 
in the back seat of an airplane uh, seat pocket. Did oh, that Joe. my son's iPad one yes, time. Yes, you did. Sorry, yes, you Finnegan, did. if you're listening. <laughs> uh, so now what? So first and foremost, say something to somebody right away. Don't wait. Uh, waiting is the worst thing you can do. Ransomware, malware, uh, loss of a device. Uh, whether it's a ransomware pop-up or you think you've lost your computer, whatever it is, just act immediately. That is the best thing that you can do. Absolute right. best thing. Yeah. Talk to your HR director, your IT director, wherever you work, you know who the person is you should let know. Some firms have low jacks on their laptops, meaning they can trace the location. Um, you know, you're not aware of the security features in place. So reach out to your firm administrator because the sooner they know, the quicker they can act on it and try to get it back. But my big lesson for everyone is please make sure you're familiar with the obligations you have to your client. And right now I am talking to law firms. Um, I know we have clients that aren't law firms. I just happened to work with law firms for 41 years. So it's near and dear to my heart and always first and foremost on my mind. I mean, there are state bar formal opinions that I think, I wonder if attorneys are reading and paying close attention to that delve into the idea that you should be talking about cybersecurity and your firm's practices with your client when you first meet them. You should also be updating them about the firm's use of um, cybersecurity if there have been any changes. And you sh should, the state bar is also saying, attorneys need to be intimately familiar with how technology works so that they can follow safe practices. And in other formal opinions, it is a requirement to notify clients if their data may have been compromised. And that can be anything from your cell phone being lost, you would have to send a letter to every client, um, to a USB drive being lost, seen that happen numerous times. And this is stuff we don't ever want to have to do is tell a client this has happened. So right. clearly we want to do the work up front, the preventative work. Um, it also, the state bar also recommends if you're emailing with your client and you're sending exceptionally sensitive information, that you should be encrypting that email and discussing with your client how you're going to be sharing that information. That email, our traditional email, wouldn't be adequate enough. And Correct. that's why a lot of our law firms have the advanced, um, or that I believe, yeah, the advanced package and proof point allows you to pick a word, any word you want, and once you type that in your subject line of your email, it will in notify Proofpoint that you want to encrypt that email, and then you have a completely different experience. Your client has to log into a portal to read the email. They'll send the reply. You have to log into a portal to read the reply, and you are now having an encrypted email exchange. Much so, like we do with our doctors and, and, and insurance. Exactly. So why would it be any different with your legal work, right? It's still highly confidential and personal. So we just want to remind everyone of that. So please reach out to me if you're not familiar with these formal opinions. I'm happy to send you that information. Um, I just can't say enough how important that is. And the other thing you should do right away is if you've had one of these compromises, notify your cyber insurance company immediately um, yep. if you have that type of insurance. And a lot of our clients do now. Yeah, and keep really good notes on the timeline of events, what happened, who called who, who reacted to what, what was done, because all of that information will be required to uh, reconstruct the timeline of when it happened, who it happened to, uh, what was the reaction time? What was done? Uh, all of that information for the security incident. And that way you can easily provide a report to them uh, in addition to the related costs and being able to pinpoint what that is. That's right. So Joe, we have a question in the chat window. Can rogue bad actors read passwords in password manager? That's a great question. Uh, the answer to that is no or maybe. And here's the reason why. Uh, 
things such as one password or last pass and so forth, they different they all have different techniques of encrypting the database that's used for that. Now, uh, with one password, they encrypt the database of those passwords that you're keeping. And one password does not keep a copy or a key of that on their servers. So if one password's servers were compromised, it's true that they may gain access to the uh, a store, but it's all googly gark. There is no way to decrypt it because they don't have okay. the encryption keys and one password doesn't keep it. Um, now. And the reason I say maybe, if you reuse the password that you use to encrypt your 1Password database, then it's possible if you've reused that password somewhere and that password is on a list somewhere or you volunteer it or it's gathered somehow, they could. I mean, it'll be highly unlikely because how are they going to know that's what it's used for? Plus, they would need to have access usually to your local computer uh, or uh, break into one password systems, and then then they're going to have to know what database is yours. I mean, there's a lot of layers to it that yeah. are like what ifs. Yeah. So in, in the grand scheme of things, your stuff is safe. Uh, you don't have to w worry about them reading what's in your password manager. Now, I say that with a grain of salt because not all password managers are made the same. Uh, there was one in the news recently that got hacked, and people were worried about it. Uh, because they did keep a copy of the uh, encryption keys on their server. Now, they were not with the databases, but the keys were on their server. So could there be a correlation between the two and it be decrypted? Possibly. Right. Uh, and that's when they had everybody change their passwords, and then you're, you're safe again. One password doesn't follow that. Uh, they did do things differently with that. So always do your research in the password manager that you're going to be using. Talk to your IT admin or your MSP to vet them out. And that way you can have a good understanding of what's going on. And ultimately, the, the goal of our discussion today is just what we outlined is being able to successfully manage your devices and the data, no matter where you're working, but most importantly, when you're out of the office, because that is the risk area, uh, because we want you to be secure. We want your clients to feel secure and taken care of. And in the end, Everybody still has a job at the end of the day. That's and the goal. That's, that's the goal. That is the goal. Well, thank you all very much for entertaining us for an extended version of <laughs> Webinar Wednesday for with us today. Betty, thank you for your research on the, the formal opinions, too. There's a lot more information on that. And if you're interested, please reach out to Betty to get more information. And just as a reminder, all of our presentations and much more can be found on our YouTube channel. Uh, Betty will post that link in our, our chat window. Feel free to visit there and subscribe. That way, when we do post uh, more information, uh, whether it's our webinar, Wednesday material, or otherwise, uh, you can be notified and you can watch that at your leisure. Right. Until and, and next time. <laughs> I just posted the link for you to the website. And that way, you can share it with others in your organization if you want them to watch a particular topic. But thank you for yes, attending. Thank you all. Next month, we're going to be talking about moving our documents and email to the cloud and what to entertain. So kind of play, playing on the uh, managing your, your devices and data out of the office, but uh, more importantly, documents and data and your email. Until then, thank you all very much for uh, being with us today. And we'll look forward to having you with us next month. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.